a little background that I um, used to be a commissioner on this ethics commission, and the commission on ethics is comprised of eight individuals. Four of them are appointed by the governor, and four are appointed by the Nevada Legislative Commission. So we try to be, um, you know, cross over the two branches of government over which we have jurisdiction, the legislative and the executive. No more than four of the eight members can be of any one political party, no more than four from any one county. So therefore we have no geographic uh, uh, prevalence nor uh, uh, political party prevalence. Um, we have jurisdiction over all public officers and all public employees, all not just at the state level, but at the county, city, uh, improvement district, every political subdivision in the state of Nevada that has employees or appointed or elected public officers must work within the ethics and government laws. And I think that that's surprising sometimes when I make that statement because this little known commission, while we've become more known since I've been there, I think I'm a loud mouth, but uh, our recent United States Supreme Court decision and my efforts to publicize to our constituency the fact of the commission and the substance of the commission um, has brought to the public's awareness uh, or has heightened the public's awareness of our role and our mission. So today I'm going to spend about 70, 75 minutes going through the three major pieces of what the Commission on Ethics does. And I've built into that presentation plenty of time for questions. While this is a public meeting and, and uh, this body and most bodies are used to a more formal environment, I'm going to invite you to interrupt me. And you, not only the council, but anyone in the room to interrupt me. If there's a question about the material that I'm talking about and I'm not being clear, it's more important to me to have my message heard than to go through uh, a, an uninterrupted presentation. So please, if, if there's something that I say that doesn't make sense or if you have a question in your mind about something in particular, stop me because this is for you, it's not for me. I am a lawyer. I, I need to tell you I'm not your lawyer and I don't want to be. And what I'm giving you today is not legal advice. It might be uh, a resource so that you can seek legal advice and analyze your own legal status. But mostly what I'm giving you is um, Jewish mother advice, which I'm one of those and I'm very well qualified. Uh, and so I might advise you to, to take a certain uh, action, but please don't confuse that with legal advice. That's what Mr. Cadlick, Ms. Chase, and that staff is for. So, we have this Commission on Ethics, these eight brilliant people appointed by various elected officials, and, and what are they supposed to do? Well, obviously our vision, the whole reason for having an Ethics Commission or Ethics at all is to preserve that public trust. Public servants must be committed to preserving the public's trust in our democratic process. Otherwise, the whole thing wouldn't work. Representatives need to be trusted to represent their constituents and do so in a principled way. And how are we going to affect that? We're going to enhance that public's faith and confidence in our government by ensuring that you, public officers and public employees, uphold that public trust and keep that as your, uh, your goal, upholding the public trust by committing to avoid conflicts between your private interests and your public duties. And that is not to say that those never overlap but they shouldn't conflict. How do we do that? I'm gonna help you to know. But I think this graphic is really perfect for my presentation because, I don't know, I've tried to ride a unicycle. I don't know if anyone else in this room has, but it's the least intuitive thing I've ever done next to windsurfing. Um, and at least this, when you, when you fall, you hit the asphalt and you have a chance to put your foot down. Windsurfing, you just fall forward on that mast and it hurts. So I would recommend the unicycle over windsurfing. But when you're on a unicycle, your center of gravity has to be over that wheel. And so when you start falling forward, you want to put your foot down so you don't fall. But the la that's the last thing you should do. You should paddle to bring your, your wheel under your body weight. And it, you have to turn your mind off. So it's not intuitive. The idea is that ethics in government is not intuitive. Sometimes the statutes aren't clear, and so sometimes if you follow your gut, what's right to do, 
it might conflict with the ethics and government law. Now that sounds very odd, but you'll see why in a, in a little bit. But one needs to balance the public's trust against your private interests, and balancing on that un unicycle doesn't always work. And so I suggest to you that you do what this graphic suggests, and that is reach out and hold on to something. And when I was learning how to ride the unicycle, I was hanging onto the side of a pickup truck so hard that I didn't want to let go. And when I did, of course, I hit the pavement, but that was good reason not to want to let go. But the idea is that if you do reach out and hold on to something as you're learning that balance between your public duties and your private interests, we're going to help you by extending a hand, the Nevada Commission on Ethics, and your legal staff for that matter. What do we do? What does this commission do? We really have a, a myriad of duties, but these are the main ones. Number one, we interpret and provide guidance. That's the important part for you. <laughs> Excuse me. On the ethics and government laws, and that's NRS 281A. And 281A only, that's our jurisdiction. Don't ask me about the open meeting law. That's NRS 241, and that's George Taylor's problem at the Attorney General's office, I know about NRS 281A, okay? We also investigate and adjudicate ethics complaints. And that's a lower case C, not a upper case C like a litigation, but a complaint, somebody unhappy with the ethical or the behavior of a public officer or a public employee brings those to our attention and we investigate them. And when there is substance to the complaint, we adjudicate those and that's really what the commission's role is. And that's applying the facts to the law in a quasi-judicial environment and imposing sanctions for violations. And finally, like any good bureaucracy, we accept filings of paper. Financial disclosure statements that are currently required are being redirected to the Secretary of State's office as of 2013, but for the next two years, you're stuck with me. Um, and other written disclosures that are required of public officers are accepted by the Ethics Commission, and we keep those on file. Some of them we make available publicly through our website, and others we just keep in a file cabinet wondering if anybody's ever going to care to look at them. We keep them for six years and destroy them dutifully, and then you don't have to worry. So that doesn't seem like all that much, does it? So why do we need an ethics commission? Five staff people. We're the second smallest um, general fund agency in the state of Nevada, by the way. And I told the Ways and Means and the Senate Finance Committees that, and they were like, well, who's the first? <laughs> who's the smallest? Well, it was some agency on aging and something else. I don't know. We're pretty tiny because you guys pay part of our way. The um, Ethics Commission is funded by state and local governments. 24% of our budget, I'm sorry, 26% of our budget comes from the state, but 74% comes from local government. So that's why I said yes when you invited me. But why do we need do we do an ethics? Voluntarily, so we can interrupt. Excuse me. Do we do that voluntarily? Um, no. Okay, just wanted to know. But I'm, I don't think, Mr. Iazzi, I don't think you were at the legislature um, opposing that measure. So I guess you do. Lots of things. All right. I understand that, you know, um, taxing governments for the services provided, you know, it's all about consolidation of services, isn't it? Not overlapping these things. You heard some more about that this morning on the news with your fire department. Anyway, this is not news. This idea of needing ethics direction is not news. It's part of our founding. You know, John Adams. American founding father and second U.S. president recognized that it's not just 2011 and the fabric of American society is unraveling because of all these ethical challenges. This has been going on forever. John Adams said, because power corrupts, society's demands for moral authority and character increase as the importance of the position increases. So the more power you have, the more temptations you have to use that power either for your own benefit or for the benefit of someone that you have a commitment to. But that means that you have to exercise more self-discipline or have really good legal advisors, and you have both. So you should be in good shape. But just know that this concept is not new. It's been going on forever. It's not just since Bill Clinton, right? All right, so let's go through the filings with the Nevada Commission on Ethics because they're the easy ones to grasp. NRS 281A and 600 and 610 require public officers to 
file a statement of their financial condition annually with the commission disclosing their sources of income, their debts other than their mortgage to their home, um, their uh, household, other members of their household and such. Why? Because these are the sorts of things that might tug at your uh, temptation to act on your own behalf rather than on behalf of your your fiduciary duty or your, your public duty. And so if you are appointed to a position like Mr. Clare was recently appointed because that in, includes employed and or you're elected as the rest of you are at the dais or, and are entitled to receive an annual compensation of $6,000 or more. Andrew, I hope that you fit in this category. You must file a financial disclosure statement annually on or before January 15th for the preceding calendar year. Simple enough. It's not a very intrusive form. You don't have to say, you know, all these details about your financial situation. You simply say how much you earn, which is probably public record anyway, as a part of your public duty. Who else in your household lives there and where do they get paid because your spouse's employer might, you might have an interest in keeping them happy, right? Uh, and uh, where do you own property? Who do you owe money to? And that's basically it. And that goes up on our website. And if you fail to do this before the 15th of January every year, we send a nice list over to the Secretary of State's office and they fine you. And those fines accumulate daily as you're you fail to, you know, days after January 15th. And uh, the Secretary of State's pretty good about chasing after you for the money as well as the disclosure. So know that uh, if you're a public officer and you're elected, appointed, or appointed to an unexpired term of an elected person, you've got to disclose your financial status every year. If you are appointed, you do it to the Ethics Commission. If you're elected, you do it to the Secretary of State. And that confusion is what we're trying to clear up in 2013 because everybody goes, okay, well, I'll just send it to both of you because I can't figure this out. We, we share. But uh, follow with somebody, please. In addition, the Ethics Commission accepts filings of statutory ethical statements. And every public officer, regardless of whether you're paid or not, must at the beginning of their term, at the time they're appointed or elected, certify that they have read, received, read, and understand NRS 281A. Why do we do that? Well, it's sort of like when you buy a, a house and you're signing those mortgage pay statements, you know, papers they stick in front of you and say, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. You sign them and you haven't read them and you take them home with every good intention of going through that pile and it goes in your to-do pile and every month you move it until finally you put it in a file folder in, in a file cabinet and you forget about it, right? Well, don't do that with this, okay? Don't sign it until you've read NRS 281A and you've received, read, and understand your duties under the ethics and government law. And this training will help you do that. And what's more is there's a second signature block that says, and I recognize it's my responsibility to update myself after every legislative session to the changes in the law. Okay, so don't rely on counsel. They're not the ones going to be sanctioned. Don't rely on your colleagues. Don't rely on your staff. Call me. I'll send you an update. Attend a training or read the changes in the law yourself. NRS 281A, something changes nearly every legislative session, and it may or may not affect your behavior. Hopefully your city attorney will be on it and will issue some sort of notice so that you'll know to go look. But it is your responsibility as a public officer to do so, no one else's. Although there are a lot of city clerks who helped you do the financial disclosure statement filing and there are a lot of folks in your, in your lives that will help you to do these things, it's not their responsibility, it's yours. And finally, we uh, accept filings of agency representation disclosure forms. Now, I, I'm less familiar with the members of the Reno City Council than maybe I should be. Are any of you uh, attorneys or accountants? There are, but they're not here. They're not here. Well, they, they're the ones that need to learn this stuff. But if, for example, well, this, the law says any public officer who has represented or counseled a private person before compensation 
before an agency of state government, and the executive branch has to disclose that representation annually. So while I was a commissioner on the, on the Ethics Commission, I was an attorney in private practice. My practice was real estate litigation. I had no idea about practicing before uh, uh, public bodies, but I represented this podiatrist in a commercial lease dispute. No big deal. And then two years later, she calls me up and says, Karen, will you go with me because the State Board of Podiatry has some issue with my Yellow Pages ad. I said, you want me to go to Las Vegas? Are you paying? She says, yeah. And I said, are you going to buy my plane ticket? Yeah. And uh, can we go to that vodka bar that's down in Las Vegas that only has vodka? I've never been there, and I wanted to go. Red Square, that's right. And we went. And I said, I'm on. We're, we're in. And we go down to the State Board of Podiatry, and I, of course, uh, explained away the issue that they had. I'm sure I was brilliant. And they let her go, and we went to Red Square, and we came back to Carson City. And about uh, December, the Commission on Ethics elected me its chair. So I thought, mm, this is a good time for me to take NRS 281A home and reread it, since I don't want to make a fool of myself as chairman. And it sat on my nightstand for about three months, because I couldn't make it past you know, the first two sections without falling asleep. And about March, I get to NRS 281A 410 subsection 3 that says, I had to disclose the fact that I represented a private person for compensation before a state agency of the executive branch. And I didn't do it by January 15th, and I went, oh crap, I can see the headline now. Commission on Ethics Chairman Violates Ethics Law. You saw that headline, right? No, you didn't. Because one of the very, so you understand, I should have done that. Why? Because maybe a State Board of Podiatry member would come before the Ethics Commission and I didn't like the way they dealt with me or, you know, maybe my client's matter is pending and I would go easier hard on them based on that. That's why they want me to disclose. Transparency is the buzzword in government. But one of the very, very best things the Ethics Commission does and one of the vote most valuable things we can do for you is my next slide. And that is, we provide advisory opinions about past, present, or future conduct to you on a confidential basis. When you come to us and say, oops, I think I messed up, or I'm thinking about starting a business that might contract with government, does that collide with the ethics and government laws? Or, I forgot to file my agency representation disclosure statement before the 15th of January. What do I do now? So I was panicked, hyperventilating, losing sleep. I came to the commission and I said, mea culpa, what do I do now? And they said, take a deep breath and file the dang form. Nobody had come to the commission office to look for the public document. Because who cares? But nobody had come to look for it. No harm was done. And if I filed the form, it would be available for six years if anybody wanted to see it. The, the advisory opinion process is not punitive. It's not intended to be punitive. The, the caveat, however, is if a member of the public had come looking for my form and it wasn't on file and they made a complaint to the Ethics Commission, Ethics Commission would have gone, yep, she didn't file it on time, and I probably would have been sanctioned, whatever amount, found to have violated, because indeed I did. So when it's confidential, the Ethics Commission is not going to tell anybody about it. If you come to us in good faith and say, what, did I, what do I do? What should I do? Should I enter this venture? Should I not? And you follow our advice, you will not be sanctioned unless a member of the public actually has a complaint and learns about your misstep, the Commission on Ethics will not, uh, it would chill the, the advisory opinion process if we took action against folks who messed up. And we recognize that often the people who come to us for advice really did misstep. Those who intentionally cross the line are not gonna come to us for advice. So the idea is that if you have a question Bring it. Write us a letter. The statute provides us 45 days to respond to you. And the entire commission gets together 
and we give you our best advice. But we've been able to turn that around in fewer than three days if there is a bona fide reason for it. And in that instance, it was a bid that had a deadline, and this uh, elected official needed an answer whether he or she could be one of the bidders in this process, and it was a lot of money, and we, and we got an opinion out right away. Now, telephonic, albeit, and it's much better in person when my eight members can look at each other, uh, but we will get you an advisory opinion as quickly as possible. That's the best thing we can do. Let me ask about that one, because that's one of my core questions. Great. We don't get our packets for our next agenda meeting until Friday for our Wednesday meeting. I may not know who's even coming forward to me before Friday, and I might not read it until Sunday. If, if something comes up, what do I do at the meeting then? Well, you're, that's a very important question. First of all, you want to look at your packet as soon as you get it. If you, if you can. We understand that you know, this is not your main job, but it's an important one that you've taken on and you want to get into your packet as early as possible because there might be questions you have of staff before Wednesday. So I, I, I wholeheartedly encourage you to look over the weekend. I understand that part of my job. But you're going to call me on Monday morning if you see it over the weekend. If you don't see it until the day of the meeting, talk to your lawyer. Talk to your colleagues. Make a good decision. Make the best decision you can but get us a request for advisory opinion right away. It doesn't exculpate you if we say you should have done this or you did it right. I mean, the fact is, at least we can mitigate the harm. And let me give you an example. The city of West Wendover, city council, four of the five members work for Pepper Mill Casinos, Inc. Okay? Everybody knows that. But sure enough, there was a, a land use issue or a development issue that came up before the city council and they had to vote. And every single time there's something like that, they all disclose and they all say, but I can be objective and they vote anyway. Well, they forgot to disclose that time. So sure enough, as soon as the vote was taken, some member of the public brought it to their attention and they immediately called and said, what do we do? And the city attorney and the ethics commission said, you know, at the very least, mitigate the harm, put it on your next agenda, disclose, retake the vote, and there will only have been a week where there was some confusion about, in the public's eye, about whether there should have been a disclosure. You know, that's not really going to enhance the public's process, but if it really is an oops, we understand that those happen. But the more likely thing that you would do, if you can't tell whether you should disclose and abstain or what to do on an agenda item, is ask the body to table it until the next meeting. Well, sometimes we're under time restraints where if we, we only have so long to make a decision. And if it's not there, it's, I mean, we have statutorily like 60 days to make some decision in land use and we've got to go through the planning commission and we're up against something and we just don't have time. Is that the case where, the, where you guys might deal with this in three days? It is. And, and certainly, you know, our two weeks is our average. Uh, we'd like to have that time because trying to get eight people together is just, like, impossible. Plus staff, time to review it to give them but some again, sort I'll of... I'll tell you, you signed up for the job. Oh, no question. <laughs> they did, and you know what? They rallied, too. This is a good group. But I've got to tell you, if there's no way to get advice before you act, use your best judgment. Well, and you might violate the ethics and government laws, but I'm going to tell you that if you use your best judgment and you get the advice from your counsel and you, you, you really, you know, suffer through it and come to a decision, your sanction is going to be significantly minimized compared to, oh, what the heck, I'm doing whatever I want anyway. Well, let me be more uh, and ask about the, the one that we know about, and that's Mike Kerrigan. He did well, everything, we're going to talk about him today. He did everything you just said. No, well, well, then let me let me digress on this one more because here's what I'm ready. And, but all that comes to us is a company is proposing something. I don't know who's behind it. I don't know who they've hired as a third party to come and represent them. So I might think it's X Y Z company, and then Joe Blow comes up and. Uh, and I'll give you another <laughs> example: some uh, a, a first party advisory opinion request. So it's confidential. I can't tell you who it was, but a council member in a city in Nevada. Uh, voted on a matter that came before the council and then learned later that the council member's spouse was employed by the parent of the subsidiary that they voted about. Oh crap. 
I should have probably disclosed and maybe even abstained. And this individual came to us and, and said, oh my gosh, what do I do? I think I made a mistake. But the fact is that that city council member did not know at the time of the vote of the conflict. So how could that person have been affected by it? Um, and so therefore, this kind of uh, premise came out that you can't disclose that which you don't know, but you have a duty to inquire. Now, this individual was married to the individual who earned money and presumably signed the tax return and, you know, whatever, should know what their spouse is earning and where their bread is buttered, but at the same time, you can't disclose that which you don't know. Sometimes known as the ostrich defense, um, it was used by Oscar Goodman, as a matter of fact, in um, a matter that came before the commission uh, regarding his uh, participation in a National Council of Governors Conference uh, that his staff had put out an invitation to attend a reception for his son's company. And Mayor Goodman said, you know, I don't write the invitations. I don't know. Staff did that. Well, that's not always a, a okay response. Um, that you intentionally don't know is not uh, not something that's going to be seen as a favorable excuse. So I hope that, Councilman Ayazi, that helps you to some extent. To some extent, yeah. It's the best I can do. You've got to know they don't let me vote anymore, so I can't tell you what the commission is going to do. I'm not, I'm not what a favorable outcome every time. I just have a hard time figuring out when I can ask and how soon I'll get an answer. And well, you know, what, what, if we're the gonna first talk about step Mike, is later, to ask. We'll talk about Mike. The first step is to ask. And so, if you ask, you might get an answer, or you might not, and we'll deal with that then, okay. okay? Let me go on and say, the advisory opinions are the best resource you have, please use them. And I keep saying that, and then I go before the legislature and they say, why is it that your caseload is you know, ris rising so much? Well, because I'm asking people to use the resources that the legislature put into place for your benefit, use us. We also respond to ethics complaints from the public about the conduct of the same public officers and public employees, and we call those third-party requests versus first-party requests. We don't call them complaints with a capital C. We call them requests for opinion because it's not litigation. It's a request for the commission's opinion about your own first-party conduct or a third-party's conduct, and we call them RFOs. So you'll hear me refer to RFOs. That's what it is. Can I ask you a question on sure. that? Sure. If you get a, a, a third party request or from the public, then do you inform the elected official that there is an, a request? We do. That's the very first thing that happens is a notice to the subject of the request that we've received it. The very first thing is, do we have jurisdiction? Is this a complaint about uh, uh, the ethics and government laws? So the first thing is a jurisdictional de determination. Do we have power over this? The second thing is a notice to the subject and a request for a response to the allegations. And unfortunately, a lot of people lawyer up at that point. That's not necessary, at, particularly at that point. The response just is, well, here's my side of the story. And then we have a two-party panel of our commission that really looks at the baseline. Is there any there there? Is there even a minimal level of credible evidence to support these allegations? And that happens after an investigation. And so we don't just take every, com every complaint with a small C that comes in and act on it. We only take those within our jurisdiction. And then the next step is, is there a sufficiency in the, in the request to make it reasonable for us to act? So you'll know, but the rest of the world won't know because we are prohibited from confirming or denying the acceptance or the, the um, fact of a request for opinion until it has cleared the panel process. So the media asks all the time, well, I just got a, a call from somebody who filed an ethics complaint about Councilman Gustin, and I'll go, I can't confirm or deny the, the uh, existence of any such complaint. We don't talk until our panel has said there's at least some credible evidence that these allegations have merit. All right, is that helping? Thank you. Great. All right, Senator Richard Bryan was one half of the team that created the Ethics Commission in 1977, 
And he said this was advisory opinion process was one of his proud points. He said it would be impossible to draft an ethics legislation that would cover every possible case. But the saving grace of this legislation is that an individual in a twilight area can request an opinion before taking an action. And this was copied from some other jurisdiction where it worked really well. And it really helps to emphasize that the Ethics Commission's desire is to be more of an, a help and an education source than a punitive or prosecuting source. And Senator Bryan at that time uh, worked really hard to make sure that that part of our legislation was clear. But make certain that you know that it's limited to Chapter 281A. Chapter 281A of the Nevada Revised Statutes is all that the Ethics Commission will deal with. And I get calls all the time about open meeting law, about morality issues, about association issues, about free speech issues, you name it. All that the Ethics Commission is going to give you uh, guidance about and all that we have jurisdiction about is NRS 281A. The Commission has jurisdiction over public officers. And what is a public officer? And the best way to know if you are one is that you are elected or appointed to a position established by law. And you can point to the law at whatever level it is and say, there's where my position was established. Now, I would bet that the city manager is established in Reno ordinance somewhere, city manager position. And if not, it's provided for in statute. If it's not, and Mr. Klinger is probably not a public officer. So if you can point to the place in the law where your position is created, you're halfway there. But you also have to meet the second half of the test, and that is that this, pow this position exercises a public power, trust, or duty. And that is defined in statute as having the administrative discretion or the ability to formulate public policy, the ability to expend or direct the expenditure of public money and the duty to administer the laws and rules of your political subdivision. All three of those points must be present, and we can point in the law to where your uh, position is established. Bingo, you're a public officer. I would tell you that all of you elected folks, you're public officers. Appointed folks, look for that place in the black and white because you may or may not be. And what I was surprised to find is that the Clark County Superintendent of Schools is not a public officer. His position is permitted by statute that the, the school district, uh, what is it, the school board may employ those people as necessary to take, carry out its mission, but nowhere does it say thou shalt have a, a, a superintendent of schools for Clark County. This gentleman uh, controls the second largest budget in the state of Nevada. Not a public officer. We have no idea where his household gets his, in well, we do, but, you know, he is not required to subject himself to the same public scrutiny as other public officers. I think it's a flaw in the law. I think he was intended to be a public officer, but these are the, these are the things that the black letter law says, you are or you aren't. Washoe County, I'm not so sure what our school person is, but uh, look on my website and find out if there's an FDS. Public officers do not include a judge or an officer of the court. A couple of reasons. Number one, judges are in the judicial branch, separation of powers. And secondly, judges have their own rules. They're called canons of judicial conduct. They have their own ethics issues to deal with, which, as we've learned from the Kerrigan case, are, can be somewhat different from those that apply to other public officers. Persons serving in an advisory capacity. Many jurisdictions have planning commissions that have recommendation authority only. Those individuals are not public officers because they don't exercise that administrative discretion in the second part of the test. County health officers. For some reason, no one can explain, and it's not in the legislative history. County health officers were exempted from being public officers, and it happened in 1999. So this is like you get a roll of lifesavers if you can answer the question about why county health officers are exempted. Couldn't tell you. And state legislators, thanks to Senator Warren Hardy, who took his matter to the Nevada Supreme Court to help us all learn that the Nevada Constitution uh, prohibits one branch of government 
from designating or delegating to another branch of government its duties to police itself. Now, beyond the fact that we are half appointed by the Nevada legislature and half by the governor, the Nevada Supreme Court in its infinite wisdom called us an executive branch agency. So therefore we have no uh, uh, jurisdiction over state legislators when they are exercising core legislative functions. But sorry, you as local legislators, you fall within the ambit of the Ethics Commission because our state constitution only uh, has that uh, separation for state legislators. Don't ask me, that's another crazy thing in the law and maybe someday that'll go to the United States Supreme Court but our time to appeal that ruling has passed. I wasn't with the commission at that time unfortunately because I like going to the United States Supreme Court. We also have jurisdiction over public employees. Public employees is obviously the largest body of our constituency and probably the ones that are least likely to know that they have to follow the ethics and government laws. And of course a public employee is defined in law as someone who performs public duties for compensation from a government. Surprising, isn't it? They got one really clear. They, but ultimately those public employees uh, acts fall under the direction or control of a public officer. So uh, it always lands in the lap of a public officer, those acts. Uh, but those public officers don't always have intimate knowledge of their public employees' acts and therefore public employees are individually responsible. Um, unfortunately, public employees don't have to sign that acknowledgement of statutory ethical standards form. But maybe that's something that the uh, that various personnel departments will choose to share uh, with new hires when they share their sex harassment policy and various other things when you're hired, uh, but it's not required. We also have jurisdiction over former public officers and public employees by virtue of our two-year statute of limitations. So a lot of folks tend to misbehave, you know, sometime between the election and the end of their term for some reason. And, you know, don't look back because they're lame ducks or what have you and, and think nobody's watching. Well, we will accept a request for opinion about conduct during any part of someone's term and for two years after the act itself. So don't stop looking over your shoulder for two years after you leave office. They can still, they, one can still bring a, a request for opinion about your conduct. And it also has the same um, two-year limitations period as, as many uh, criminal matters, and that is the, um, if the act is, is un, unable to be uh, noticed, it's uh, two years from the reasonable discovery of the act. So it could be 10 years from now if a public administrator does some horrible thing and then buries the files and we find them later. So that has happened. The other half of the Richard Bryan team was Assemblyman Joe Dini, one of my favorite characters of Nevada history and a person who, while he looks terrible these days, still remembers everything I've ever say said to him from 1984 forward, which is a little daunting because I have no idea what I've said. Um, but he was the other half and he is the master of saying simple things simply. No one should be trying to line their pockets by serving in a public office. Lord knows we've tried, right? But it's not the intent of public service. So in the Nevada Ethics and Government Laws, there is a section 281A 400. And because 400 has 10 subsections, and they all could start with thou shalt not, I call them the 10 commandments. They have absolutely nothing to do with religion, but here we go, 10 commandments. Number one, don't accept gifts services, favors, employment, economic opportunities. The word that et cetera replaces is emoluments. And since I had to look that one up, I put et cetera, which would tend to improperly influence a reasonable person to depart from the faithful discharge of his or her public duties. Don't accept them. A public officer should not accept such gifts. Now, does that mean when you get a box of seized candy at the holidays, you should say, thanks, but I can't, I can't take that? I understand that nuts and chews in particular would tend to improperly influence a reasonable person, but um, 
I don't think that a box of C's candy in a thank you capacity and something you can put out on the, on the uh, reception desk of your office, my, my personal opinion, would be the type of gift that would tend to improperly influence a reasonable person to depart from the faithful discharge of their duties. So it's not an absolute prohibition. Let's be reasonable. And here's the kicker. There are what I call fudge words in the definition. Reasonable. Let's be reasonable. What is that? Well, reasonable to me might be different than reasonable to someone else. And then we have to also look at that lovely adverb improperly, improper influence, as if all influence is bad. I mean, educate. This is, I'm influencing you right now. Is this improper influence? I'm hoping not. But the, the law is packed with these fudge words intentionally so that we lawyers have something to do, right? <laughs> and so use your judgment and don't accept gifts that would tend to improperly influence a reasonable person, okay? Ten Commandments. Don't use your public office to secure an unwarranted privilege, preference, exemption, or advantage for yourself or others. Now tell me, Mr. Klinger, um, did you have a designated parking space when you worked for the state? You didn't? Well, Brian Krolicki has one, and it's right behind the Capitol building. Did you know that? And that's obviously a preference that he's using his public office to get, don't you think? Sure. But is it warranted? I mean, this guy's got to go to the Commission on Economic Development and then over to tourism and get back in time for the Board of Examiners and Lord knows what else he has to do. He needs a parking space. So is it an unwarranted advantage for himself that he used his public office to get? Some might argue, but I would say no. But you know, on Saturday morning when I have my six and seven year old at the DMV, and Brian Krolicki in his polo shirt wanders into the front of the line, and I'm at G70, and he walks to the front and says, I'm the lieutenant governor. I need to renew my registration. First of all, he's going to have a riot at the DMV. And secondly, that might be using his public office to secure an unwarranted privilege. There is a, dis a distinction. If it's related to your work and it furthers the public's interest and in, in your public duty, Use your public office to secure it. You got a nice name tag right there. That helps, right? You're going to take it home when you're done? I don't know. Fact is, these are two of the Ten Commandments. Paul Douglas was a senator from Illinois, Chicago, from 1940 era to almost the present day. And he has a book of quotes. And I don't read Sidney Sheldon. I read Paul Douglas because I'm a geek that way, I guess. But he, he really captured it here, and especially because Nevada, the state, is a small town. We all know each other. He says, when I once asked a policeman how some of his colleagues got started on the downward path, he replied, it generally began with a cigar. Something as innocuous as going to lunch or playing a golf game. That's the slippery slope everybody talks about, and we all need to be able to identify for ourselves what we want to defend. Whether to accept a cigar or a box of C's candy or lunch. Lunch is not going to unreasonably, uh, improperly influence me. I eat lunch every day. I can buy my own, and I usually do. But I'm extra uber careful because I'm the director of the Ethics Commission. I don't want anybody to even think about challenging me in, in NRS 281A 400 subsection 2. Fact is, we all have to draw the line for ourselves. The law will draw the line for us if we go too far. But there have not been a lot of cases before the Ethics Commission about using your public office to secure personal advantage with regard to gifts. My office has established a policy that if we can put it on our reception desk and share it with everybody, it's probably acceptable. If it's personal for me to take home and enjoy, it's probably not. Somebody gave uh, a public officer a briefcase, I think, and it was determined that that was too personal of a gift. It wasn't for the officer a thank you for a, uh, uh, um, you know, doing diligent work. It was really intended to be a personal gift, and so that would be a different thing from a box of cease candy or a fruit basket, and it was dealt with differently. Every agency needs to develop its own. The city of Reno may have a gift policy. 
Just worry about that slippery slope. Thou shalt not participate as an agent of government in negotiating or executing a contract with a business in which you have a pecuniary interest. A pecuniary interest is any economic interest more than zero. Now, when I graduated from high school in 1976, I was given one share of IBM stock. So, when I buy a Dell computer through state purchasing, do I need to disclose my conflict of interest? Well, the answer is yes. The next question is, do I? I'm not answering that question. But I have a pecuniary interest in a competitor to Dell Computers, which is the uh, vendor for, uh, for the state. And so indeed, uh, I should not enter into a contract on behalf of the state with uh, a business in which I have a pecuniary interest against or in favor of their competitor. That's kind of an extreme example, but the fact is, even if you are a, a, a minor, minority shareholder or you have no power over the entity or what have you, participating at, on behalf of your government to negotiate or sign or execute, approve a contract with a business in which you have a pecuniary interest is a no-no. And accepting a salary for that which you do as a public officer that you're already compensated for, in addition to the compensation provided by the public entity which you serve, is also a no-no. We actually had a county commissioner who was on the payroll of a large corporation in the state of Nevada, over $200,000 a year salary, who was provided a title and a business card, but no office, no duties, no responsibilities, and it, that person was deemed to have accepted a salary or other compensation from a private source for performing his or her public duties. It's just not a great idea. Now that's not to say that when I go to the Rotary and speak at lunch, I don't accept their rubber chicken dinner, uh, you know, for performing my public duties as a speaker at their thing. That's not what we're talking about here, but getting compensated for being a city council person on top of the salary you accept the intent is clear. Question? No, just because that's why we didn't offer anything to eat. We didn't Thank you. I got it. water yeah. in a real glass. I appreciate it. Here's Frances Dean. Anybody remember Frances Dean from Clark County? She was the Clark County recorder or assessor at about the same time that we had a vice president who was making a lot of noise about the World Wide Web. And, uh, you know, Clark County was the, the most wealthy county at the time and still in the state, and they were able to buy a computer that probably filled this room. And they put in all of the information about the houses and the, the subdivisions and the zip codes and the income of the people who own those homes and et cetera, and it came out here. Um, and Francis Dean went, wow, that's cool, because, you know, now we take it for granted, but then it was a really big deal. And uh, she took a five and a half inch floppy disk, which actually flopped. Does anybody remember those? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm good, in good company. And she shared it with her friends because she had a marketing background. And they went, wow, that's great stuff. We could do some directed marketing based on income category, gender, age, blah, blah, blah. And so they sold these lists to marketing people. What a great idea. I mean, it was totally cutting edge. But you know what? She didn't own that data. So she was um, found to have violated the ethics and government laws by using information acquired through her public duties or relationships, which by law or practice was not at the time available to people generally, and she did it to further her own pecuniary interest and that of her colleagues. If Frances Dean had come to us for an advisory opinion or had asked you sitting next to her, somebody probably would have told her, you know, that's probably not a good idea, but she didn't ask. So please ask. Similarly, suppressing information, which might tend to unfavorably affect your pecuniary interest, is also uh, uh, prohibited. So disclosing something that might help you, as well as suppressing it. Now, this is the story of, I know where the freeway is going to go, so I'm either going to buy or sell a parcel of land by the interchange, right? And then after you've got that transaction done is when you tell everybody that's where the freeway is going to go. Not good. Now, you see a theme here, and that is furthering your own personal or pecuniary interest using your positions in government. And that's really what this is all about. And this here is um, the Kathy Augustine uh, provision. 
using government time, property, equipment, or other facility to benefit a personal or financial interest. She was using her staff, her computers, her phone, her internet, her all kinds of things as state controller, controller? Yeah, to run her reelection campaign. And she was found to have violated this provision of statute. Now, certain um, loosening of these prohibitions on using government resources is done during the legislative session for legislators because they're away from home. So it's more reasonable for them to be able to use their state computers to do personal business or to ask the Capitol Police to take them to the airport because their cars are at home in Elko or wherever. And so they have a, a wider uh, path, if you will, during the legislative session. But even you can use government time, property, equipment, or other facility for your personal or financial interest, according to the state, if four criteria are met. First, if the use is authorized by the responsible public officer or necessary in an emergency, you see something bad happening outside, please run in and use a, a government telephone to call 911, really. Um, if the use does not interfere with the performance of your public duties, if the cost or value is nominal, and it doesn't create the appearance of impropriety. If all four of those are, are okay, go ahead and use, whoops, and use the government resources for your personal interest. When my telephone rings and it's the school saying my children are bleeding on the playground again, I take the call. Similarly, when I'm in Las Vegas with a motor pool car, a state car, um, and I go to the Sunset Station because I can get an, a room for $49 and I hate the casinos, I take that car to Rubio's Fish Tacos which is one of my favorite places to eat in Las Vegas, and that is for my personal interest, but I'm allowed to eat. The co I authorize it because I'm the head of the agency. The use doesn't interfere with my performance of my public duties because my meeting is over for the day. It's, you know, two blocks from anywhere you can find a Rubio, so the cost or value of the use is nominal, and parking the state motor pool car at Rubio's doesn't really hurt anybody. Nobody thinks that that's weird. But on my way to Pahrump, I've only been there twice, when you drive over the mountain from Las Vegas into Pahrump, you see this, um, there's nothing to look at for a really long time. And then all of a sudden there are billboards. And the very first billboard that I saw, and this was several years ago, so it's not as funny, but if you've been to Pahrump, I see you shaking your head. This says, visit the castle. And it's got this gray thing with the turrets and the towers. And I thought, wow, I'm from Pennsylvania where White Castle hamburgers are king and my mouth starts salivating and I'm like, I'm going there. And then the next one, visit the castle only five minutes away. And then one more, visit the castle. And sure enough, there it is on the left-hand side. And it's a gentleman's club. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that if I was going to the castle, maybe the use wouldn't interfere with the performance of my public duties. And it's on the way into Pahrump. But parking a motor pool car in front of the castle probably creates the appearance of impropriety. Although my friends at the Department of Taxation tell me they have to audit the sales and use tax records monthly and they go there. But I, the governor gets enough calls about me. I don't need to park there. But you gotta know that you're, although they're a legitimate business that pays taxes, the appearance of impropriety is something we need to worry about in using public resources. And I think that there was a matter of the Washoe County District Attorney using his car for various things that came before the commission in a, in a hearing uh, this year where this really was the issue, the use of his government vehicle for personal reasons and that creation of the appearance of impropriety, which is a very fluid concept. It's like reasonable or uh, uh, improper. Uh, it's a gray area. Thou shalt not attempt to benefit your personal or financial influence, I'm sorry, interest by influencing subordinates. The Carson City Board of Supervisors tells me, plow my street last, they say to their public works department. 
I don't want anybody to think I'm using my position in government to benefit my interest. But you know what that does? It messes up the whole public works you know, grid so that they have to make a special trip to plow their streets last. So by trying to avoid that appearance of impropriety, they're totally messing up the city. But if, if they were to have called and said, hey, my mom has a doctor's appointment tomorrow morning where big, there's a big uh, snowstorm coming, will you make sure that she can get out of her driveway? The public works department's not gonna tell a council member, no. For, fe for fear of retribution. <laughs> Maybe in Reno they will, I don't know. But the idea is you have power whether you intend to use it or not. And so when you go into the, um, the um, building department to get a, a permit to expand your home or to do whatever, you're not just Joe Public or Jane Public for that matter. You can't take that hat off. And it may be the perception of the public employee or subordinate, no matter how far up or down the chain there they are, that you are a council member and you are to be treated differently, whether you intend it or not. Now, the statute says that you have to attempt to benefit, so you have to have some intent, one might argue, but you just don't want to get that close. Keep that in your mind that you can't strip your, your title off and put it back on uh, when you come to sit here. Because even if you're, you haven't violated the ethics and government law, you don't want to see me in that capacity. How about seeking other employment or contracts through the use of your public office for your own personal gain? This happens um, sometimes. I think there was an allegation about Mr. Uh, Assemblyman Arbery right at the end of his term when he was still uh, on the interim finance committee and there was one more meeting while he was lobbying the 8th Judicial District to hire him as a, an advocate for the legislative session. You know, whether he was doing it or not, the, um, the paper uh, alleged that he was seeking his job with the 8th Judicial District as a lobbyist because, and, and was, was emphasizing his chances by holding one more meeting over their head saying, you really want to hire me because I have one more meeting kind of thing. So seeking other employment or contracts through using your public office. In that instance, it seems clear. In other instances, it hasn't been so clear. We had a city council member who during a break went to a uh, department head that was sitting in the audience and uh, this individual was known to have been between jobs and asked the person, hey, do you know of any jobs that are out there? Will you give me a recommendation? Tell me, you know, refer me if you hear of anything. And um, and there was an agenda item about that department later in the agenda, and it, that was perceived to be both of these two uh, subsections being implicated. So again, you know, when you run for public office, you paint a big target on your back, and you have the choice about whether it's nice neutral colors or flaming neon. And these are ways that you can make it more flaming is to uh, implicate some of these uh, sections. Those are the 10 commandments that are in uh, NRS 281A 400, but there are some other standards for public officers that I think are important. First, there's a one year cooling off period or revolving door policy that is in a statute that says um, you should not be the regulator one day and be able to get a job as the regulated the next day. And so, for example, lawyers who are uh, serving the Public Utilities Commission, they have to go practice family law or something for a year before they can go work for Southwest Gas. Uh, gaming Control Board, same thing. You can't be an auditor for Gaming Control and then go work for uh, MGM the next day after you retire. So there's a one-year cooling off period. The, the perception is that you're juice, whatever juice you have as a public employee or a public officer is somehow diluted after a one-year period. And as a matter of fact, there were provisions added to the legis this legislative session that provides a two-year cooling off period in certain circumstances. So know that when you leave public office, if you're going into an area of uh, enterprise that might implicate this, take a good look at the statutes. There are very specific provisions for certain areas of practice or areas of enterprise that you know are too detailed to go into today, but just know that those exist. So if this doesn't apply to the legislature, how did it apply to Mr. Arbor? It does apply to the legislature because the state legislators are only exempt from our jurisdiction when they are um, uh, engaged in core legislative functions such as voting, disclosing, abstaining, 
core legis introducing legislation, core legislative functions. When Arbery's driving the motor pool car, he shouldn't go to the White Castle either. It's actually a gray castle, and actually they've changed their name since, since then, but I forget what they're called now, girls, 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 maybe. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we do have authority over uh, legislators, and we actually provide a lot of advisory uh, opinions to legislators, because legislative council refers them to us straight away um, for their conduct in between sessions, mostly. There shall be no contracts between a governmental agency and a business entity in which a public officer has a pecuniary interest. This contracting with government uh, concept appears several places in statute, two places in NRS 281A, but it also appears in NRS 281, which ha has criminal implications, and that's usually uh, related to graft uh, and uh, other criminal behavior. Note that we're an administrative agency. We can't throw you in jail. We can't, uh, you know, charge you with, with crimes. We are uh, able to find violations and impose monetary sanctions only. Our, our biggest hammer, if you will, is that with three willful violations in your uh, career, we can um, recommend you for removal from office for malfeasance or misfeasance. That's our biggest hammer. So don't worry about going to jail but um, certainly you can worry about your next election. So I think that you need to be aware about the contracting provision. If you have an interest in a business that's contracting with a government agency, take a good look at that. There shall be no honoraria for performing public duty, and the honoraria section is really about when I um, go to a conference and, and the conference provides me with travel expenses and conference registration in exchange for me being a speaker, but maybe Mr. Klinger is offered $7,500 plus those things. That's an honorarium. When you get anything more than the average or the market for your services, that's an honorarium, and that is considered like accepting a salary for performing your public service. And go ahead. I, what, what if it's not anything that, to do with what you have any oversight over? You know, the Navy calls me and says, I want you to go to Bethesda and give a speech. The Navy calls you? All the time. To give a speech about what? No, I'm just making something up. I, well, I don't you're know. not doing that as a public officer, are you? No. Okay. Okay. If you're going to go talk about being a Reno City Council member, then you might want to read that section of statute and talk to Mr. Cadlick and his staff. I'm sure you're aware that you may not cause a governmental entity to make an expenditure to support or oppose a ballot question or a candidate. This is often comes into play with um, law enforcement and schools when they have a, a ballot question on to um, build a new fire station or what have you. Who is more likely to advocate on behalf of a fire station than the firefighters or the chief of police or what have you? But indeed, it's using public dollars, taxpayer dollars, to influence taxpayers. That's considered inappropriate. But we, get, we have several opinions about whether the chief of police can wear his or her uniform in a campaign ad and whether, you know, those sorts of things is very different. But using taxpayer dollars to influence taxpayer opinion is the simplest way I can interpret the application of this statute. There are the criminal uh, statutes that apply, and I wanted to just bring them to your attention. They're not within the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. But a lot of them kind of parallel the concepts of the Ethics Commission. The anti-nepotism provisions that you can't hire your own uh, blood re relations within certain degrees of consanguinity. The prohibited contracts with government entities and business entities in which public officers have a, a pecuniary interest. And those personal profits from public office. You'll note that nobody issues their book until they're out of public office, right? Raggio's hit the stands, what, moments after his uh, after his leaving, and uh, Congresswoman Vukanovic, same way. And so, um, so issuing... So how does that two-year statute of limitations apply that you said? The act did not happen during the term of office. All the knowledge that made the book did. The act took place after. How's that? Are you a lawyer? What do you do for a no, living? this is what I do for a living. It is? It is. Argue with people? Yes, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to change my, my uh, visual image now from the unicycle 
to the tightrope. But the concept is the same. Balance is what we're after. But know that this is the third part of my presentation, and it has to do with disclosure and abstention. This is probably the, the piece that you're most interested in. Um, but know that that graphic is misleading. While it looks like that individual is on a tightrope 30 feet above the, the ground, it really should be about three inches. And that should not be solid ground at all. It's shark infested waters, okay? Because those sharks, the lawyers, are right there waiting for you to misstep. Because I hear from them all the time. And we all know that there are uh, votes that are in the paper every day about disclosure and abstention. That sh and this is Mr. Kerrigan's issue as well. And you've got to know that I think Mike Kerrigan is a swell guy. I've really enjoyed knowing him, and I was on the commission when that um, vote took place. And I think that he has brought a lot of clarity to the First Amendment and to our laws. So I, I want to say that from the get-go. We need to know what a conflict of interest is, because that is the trigger for all disclosure and abstention. We need to know what is a conflict of interest anyway, because your definition and mine may not be the statutory definition, and that's what counts. Paul Douglas, my hero again, wherever government controls a business, it becomes inevitable that the business should try to control the government. Again, this is like John Adams. This is the way our democracy works. And you are reliant on information from the public and from business in order to do your jobs well. There's no way that you can make good decisions about all the issues that come before a city council without getting input and having relationships and hearing from the public. But no, that whenever you have control over somebody outside of these chambers, that person has a vested interest in changing your opinion. That's how it works. That's not a bad thing. But it's your job to not let your personal relationships bias or, sh or shade or have any influence on your duty as a public officer. A conflict of interest is defined in Black's Law Dictionary, which is where lawyers go when they have no clue, as a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests and one's public or fiduciary duties. It's that seeming incompatibility that gets us in trouble most often. But this is not the statutory definition of a conflict of interest. It's the Black's Law Dictionary definition. In order to know what a conflict of interest is, we, the American public, needs to understand a basic legal principle which is unattainable, and that is the definition of a reasonable person. Black's Law Dictionary did a pretty good job on that conflict of interest definition, but I, don't, I think it falls short in this definition of a reasonable person because it's hard. First, a, high, a reasonable person is a hypothetical person, which is used as a legal standard. We know that. And it is a person who exercises the degree of attention, knowledge, intelligence, and judgment that society requires of its members for the protection of their own and of others' interests. The reasonable, this is why I'm not one, the reasonable person acts sensibly, does things without serious delay, and takes proper but not excessive precautions. Well, I, I've got to tell you, I'm not any closer to understanding or being able to identify a reasonable person from that definition. So I asked staff to drill down a little farther to a treatise, and a treatise is just a discussion of the law. And this gentleman, Mr. Houston, I think hits it a lot better than Black's Law Dictionary does. The reasonable person, by the way, when you see those brackets, what does it mean? When you see text with brackets around it? It means that there was a different word there, and I'm substituting this one. Anyone want to guess what was there instead of person? Man, right. But you'll see down there at the bottom next to the last line, I left man there because it talks about the average man. But the reasonable person, not man, connotes a person whose notions and standards of behavior and responsibility correspond with those generally obtained among ordinary people in our society at the present time. And I want to emphasize that ordinary people, not lawyers, not uh, elementary school children, ordinary people in our society, and that might be the city of Reno, it might be Washoe County, it might be Nevada, it might be the United States, it might be the Western Hemisphere, it might be the Earth, the universe, 
the star system, I don't know. But the fact is the society is driven, the definition of society is driven by the issue, right? At the present time, not when the Constitution was written, not in 2008, presidential election time, and certainly not in 2011 because we know that society has changed since 2008 presidential election. At the present time means now, today, at the present time. Who seldom allow emotions to overbear reason. I'm going to suggest that Black's Law Dictionary's uh, version of that who is, is a person who acts sensibly and whose habits are moderate and whose disposition is equitable. These are someone who is trying to do the right thing, someone who's trying to be fair. And my mother-in-law tells me, fair is where you go to see the pigs. There's no place for fair in the law. Fair is not what this is about. Trying to do the right thing, being equitable. This is not necessarily the same as the average man, because that term implies an amalgamation of counterbalancing extremes. What we want is ordinary people in our society at the present time. So when we go back, to the prohibitions on gifts. A, you shouldn't accept a gift that would tend to improperly influence a reasonable person to depart from the faithful discharge of his or her duties, right? That reasonable person, not you, the more ethical and, and a heightened awareness ethical person, a reasonable person in your circumstance is what you need to be able to define. And I think that Mr. Houston gets us closer. So now that we know that we have to avoid conflicts and we know what a reasonable person is and we know all of these things, what's the best way to keep the public trust, the, the transparency that be, has become the buzzword in our nation? Disclose. Disclose anything that might be a conflict of interest. Put it on the record, throw it on the table, address the negative evidence. You tell before somebody tells on you. That's what my children do. Um, disclose. Second suggestion, disclose. Do it often, do it regularly, do it loudly. The only person who's gonna hate you is your colleagues up there on the dais because it's gonna make your meeting longer. Disclose. Your transcriptionist is also gonna hate you because you're gonna want your disclosure to be placed into the record verbatim. While there might be summary minutes of your meetings, you want your disclosure verbatim. Why? It's a CYA. It's required by law, and it needs to be in there in your words because it's your analysis that counts, not your conclusion. Disclose, disclose, disclose. Best way to stay out of ethical trouble, disclose. Have I made my point? <laughs> Disclose. So, disclosure is mandatory. Not only is it a good idea, but it is mandatory under statute for any interest created by a gift or a loan, any pecuniary interest, or a commitment in a private capacity to the interest of others. We'll define that in just a minute, but whenever something comes up, before you as a public officer that has anything to do with a gift or a loan, and I'm talking about a gift that would tend, uh, a gift that would be disclosable on your financial uh, disclosure statement, $200 or more, something that's not about your birthday or your anniversary, a gift, not a campaign contribution, a gift, or a loan. If Ms. Zadra knows I've been through a bankruptcy and I really needed a mortgage and she had a pot of gold in her backyard and so she made me a private loan, nobody's supposed to know. But I come before the Reno City Council, guess what? Somebody's going to know because she's going to disclose. It's mandatory. Any pecuniary interest that is affected by a matter before the City Council, disclose. And anything that comes before you in which that will affect a commitment in a private capacity to your own interest or the interest of others, you disclose. Disclose on the record at the time the matter is considered. Oh, disclosure must made, be made publicly at the time the measure is considered. Good thing I said that twice. Before considering a matter, you need not disclose campaign contributions because they've already been disclosed as a part of your campaign. 
those C and E reports, those pesky things that the Secretary of State requires, NRS 294A requires, you've already disclosed their public record, they're available on, your, on the websites, they're disclosed. Contributions to a legal defense fund, similarly, are disclosed in a proper manner. You need not disclose them as a part of your deliberations as city council members. But if you disclose a conflict of interest, you are prohibited from advocating or voting for the passage or failure of that matter if the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in your situation would be materially affected by one of those disclosable interests, a gift or a loan, a pecuniary interest, or a commitment in a private capacity. You may otherwise participate in the consideration of the matter, but I really recommend against it. The statute was intended for circumstances like we found in Story County, where the Director of Community Development for the county also sits on the school board. And sure enough, that school and that county were trying to do jointly make a new park. And so he was the only person in Story County who knew anything about the mercury vapor luminaires and how many kilowatts of power were going to be used and how many yards of sod and what the dimensions of the park were going to be. And so he took himself off of the school board, came down and otherwise participated in the consideration of the matter by providing facts. And let me tell you, he sweated a lot because it's really hard to provide information without advocating for or against a matter. But you may otherwise participate. I, first of all, personally suggest you leave the dais and you go to the bathroom or take a smoke break or do whatever you do because it's very difficult not to nod along while you're actively listening and that may be perceived as advocating for the position that is being, that the proponent is talking about while you're nodding. Or maybe you're nodding to some funny email you're reading. Just leave <laughs> if you can during the time that matter is being considered. If you are going to um, take yourself out of the voting, you can't advocate. And if you're going to take yourself out of the vote because the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in your situation would be materially affected by your conflict, take yourself out entirely. Can I ask a question about sure. the abstaining? Because I'm on a lot of boards and commissions and the rules seem to be different in all of them. I mean, here at the Reno City Council, we've been told from, you have to abstain right at the front and then you leave, like you just said. You do leave? That's what we do. Okay. Um, you don't have to leave. But it, uh, in other places, I've heard people talk and talk and talk, just like they were going to vote, and then right before the vote, they abstain. You're welcome to bring a request for opinion to the Ethics Commission on that. Um, the statute is clear that the disclosure must be made at the time the measure is considered, and that has been interpreted to, when the, to be when the agenda item is called. And this might not be because you said it's not under your jurisdiction, maybe, but they just abstain without any r rationale. They and just that brings say, an awful lot of requests for opinions as well because people assume you have a conflict of interest that you fail to disclose. There are often, in the minutes, I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting, so I can't approve the minutes. That's all you need to say. You just can't say I'm, I'm going to abstain. Now, since 2009, you're required to disclose, and that's the first requirement when there's a conflict of interest. Abstention for other reasons, not my problem. Your problem, not my problem. But I'm going to suggest to you that it will become my problem because I will get a public complaint about your abstention if you don't explain it on the record and we get them and I end up having my investigator listen to hours of, of deliberations trying to figure out why this person abstained and we can't tell so guess what we have to drag you in for a hearing or investigation that's just a waste of resources your time our time everybody's so tell us why you're abstaining but the statute is the statute and it trumps any local stuff that has less stringent requirements disclosure is mandatory Abstention only when the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in your circumstance would be materially affected by the conflict. And if you're going to abstain, remove yourself from all advocacy for or against and the vote. And the best way to do that is to physically remove yourself. You are welcome to sit in your chair. But it's danger zone. You're getting closer to those sharks. Okay? And again, that's Jewish mother advice. It doesn't say in the statute you have to leave your chair. All right. 
voting is permissible, even if you have a conflict of interest, when you're not going to benefit or have a detriment any more than anyone else affected by that matter. If you're in the same class of persons affected by the matter, go ahead and participate. The best example I can give you is uh, I staffed this, the Senate Committee on Transportation a long time ago when Senator Nick Horn from Las Vegas was the chair, and we put through a 50 cent increase on driver's licenses to pay for bike lanes that we called the motor vehicle recovery lanes. But it was really bike lanes for um, uh, state highways. And, um, and uh, every legislator, well, we don't have any jurisdiction over legislators anymore, but we did then, um, every legislator in the building had a driver's license and would either pay the 50 cents or not pay the 50 cents if the measure didn't pass. Nobody had to abstain because everybody was affected. Every driver's license in the state. Uh, similarly, we had a Washoe County uh, Planning Commissioner, I think it was. Gee, I don't even know if that was confidential. Maybe I won't use that ex um, example. Anyway, you get it from the driver's license example, right? The fact is that if, there are, if the, the pool of people affected by the matter is large enough that it's you know, more than five, <laughs> at least more than five, if it's a large number of people affected and you're just one of many and you're not going to benefit, or, or detriment to you, uh, more or less than anyone else, you're probably fine. Karen's rule of thumb at the bottom of the um, slide is what's important. Karen's rule of thumb is abstain, rarely, disclose often. This is different from the law that was in place in 2006 when Mike Kerrigan voted, but it was changed in 2009. And so, read with me, abstention is required only in a clear case where the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in the public officer situation would be materially affected by the conflict. Not a close case, a clear case. And it is required only if it's a clear case where it would be affected, not might, would. We have not interpreted this statute yet. I can't tell you what a clear case is. And I can't tell you how I know it would be affected. Go ahead and be my first. Or not. Just know that the abstention determination should be made by the public officer and explained on the record. What are you going to do first? You're going to disclose NRS 281A-420, subsection 1. You will disclose a mandatory disclosure conflict of interest, a gift or a loan, a pecuniary interest or a commitment in a private capacity. And then you will undertake this abstention determination. Would the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my situation, not me, a reasonable person, in my situation be materially affected by this conflict of interest? Undertake that in good faith and I will recommend or I will represent to you, I don't think the Ethics Commission can second guess your judgment. Unless you undertake that analysis in bad faith, the outcome is for the public to decide. The Commission on Ethics, if you undertake that analysis and tell us why you think a reasonable person's independence of judgment would not be materially affected and you go ahead and vote, I doubt that the Commission on Ethics will second guess your judgment. If you undertake that analysis in good faith, your lawyer might disagree with me. But put it on the record and ask that that be made part of the record verbatim. Absolutely. I need, I'm recommending that not only will you say, I need, I have a disclosure to make, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, may I make a disclosure? My disclosure is that my spouse works for the company that's appearing before us and, and my spouse's uh, employment might be uh, affected if I vote. So, I, you know, I have a pecuniary interest in the outcome of my spouse's employment. And so I, um, I don't think any reasonable person would be able to go home at night tonight and put their pillow, head down on the pillow and hope to wake up in the morning if they voted against their spouse, certainly not mine. And so, therefore, I'm not going to be voting today. And it can be that simple. But I've done two things. I've told you the nature and extent of my conflict. And I've told you my analysis of whether the independence of judgment of a reasonable person would be materially affected in this circumstance. And in, with my spouse's in, uh, circumstance, it's a clear case. All right? That should be on the record. 
that's what needs to be on the record. And uh, Bruce Woodbury was a county commissioner in, in Las Vegas. And in 1999, he came to us and he said, how much do I have to disclose? And we told him, disclose sufficient information to put the public on notice of the nature and extent of the conflict. Not, I have a conflict, I'm going to abstain. That's insufficient. Okay? Got it? Now, you lawyers, do you have it too? Because sometimes there's some really bad advice given. And there's abstention going on when it's really not necessary. And the public policy was expressly provided in statute. And I'm going to read it to you. And this is in NRS 281A420. The commission must give appropriate weight and proper deference to the public policy of this state, which favors the right of a public office officer to perform the duties for which the public officer was elected or appointed and to vote or to otherwise act upon a matter provided the public officer has properly disclosed the public officer's acceptance of a gift or a loan, the public officer's pecuniary interest or the public officer's commitment in a private capacity in the interest of others in the manner required by subsection 1. Because abstention by a public officer disrupts the normal course of representative government and deprives the public and the public officer's constituents of a voice in governmental affairs, the provisions of this section are intended to require abstention only in clear cases where the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in the public officer's situation would be materially affected by the public officer's acceptance of a gift or a loan, the public officer's pecuniary interest, or the public officer's commitment and private capacity in the interest of others. Got it? Abstain rarely disclose often do your job i believe that the legislators got a little birdie telling them sometime in 2008 2009 sometime that um, the ethics laws that required abstention made it so you couldn't do your jobs because you were required to abstain much more often than you are now now the requirement is disclosure, transparency. Put your stuff out there for the public to see, and you know what? You will be tooting your own horn. We want people involved in their communities representing us. We want you to be on the library, you know, an advocate of libraries. Why should you take yourself out of the vote because you're an advocate of reading in libraries when the library comes to you for something? I mean, it, it actually benefits you to let the voters know that you are actively involved in your community. It shows that you're not just a politician, you are a member of the community of the city of Reno. And I think that we can turn this into a positive. Disclosure is the key. What's a pecuniary interest? Any monetary interest. And campaign contributions are not those that trigger and disclosure. Remember that. At the same time, your Jewish mother is going to tell you that if you spent $250,000 on your campaign and 249000 of it came from me and I'm coming before you, I'm going to recommend that you remind people that I was a very big benefactor to your campaign. That appearance of impropriety can take you down faster than an ethics violation. Does that required? No. Is it a good idea? I think so. Doesn't matter what I think, but I'm going to tell you anyway. What is a commitment in a private capacity to the interest of others? And this is what was just um, before the United States Supreme Court in the Kerrigan matter. First, it's a commitment that you have to a person who is a member of your household. Why is that disclosable? Same reason that you're wondering about waking up with your spouse, you know, having murdered you, having voted against his or her uh, interest. You know, these people in your household, they have access to you and they somehow influence you, I would imagine. And unfortunately, that includes those Craigslist households. It's, you know, under your roof, whether you talk to that person or not. A member of your household is a member of your household. A tenant under your roof is a member of your household. Someone who is related to you by blood, adoption or marriage within the third degree of consanguinity or affinity or adoption. Now, I'll give you my consanguinity chart in a minute, but know that blood, adoption, or marriage within the third degree is more than your spouse. It's your spouse, your kids, and your siblings, and your parents, 
uh, you know, the people that you presumably have relationships with, close relationships with. Someone who employs you or a member of your household. So your employer comes before you, you disclose. Somebody who employs your 18-year-old son, you disclose. Or someone with whom you have a substantial or continuing business relationship. This one, again, you may be concerned about losing a major client if you vote against their interests. These are, again, things that might influence you. The, the, the kicker was, or other similar relationships. Now, this is not other similar relationships of people who might bias your opinion. These are similar relationships, similar to the first four listed there, like domestic partners are recognized in the state of Nevada, and they are similar to a marriage relationship, right? But they're not marriage. So similar to those listed above. But they would be a household member. They might be a member of your household. Don't you know married people who don't live together? No. You don't? We'll talk. <laughs> I got to tell you <laughs> that there are plenty of them, but what we're talking about is it's not or other relationships that might cause you to be tempted to vote in a particular way. It's relationships similar to those above. And I will tell you that it was found in 2006 that Carlos Vasquez, Mr. Uh, Councilman Kerrigan and Sparks' campaign manager for three successful campaigns with whom he had a business relationship for the conduct of his campaigns through whom several tens of thousands of dollars would flow even though Mr. Mr. Vasquez provided his services at cost was deemed to be similar to a substantial or continuing business relationship. In addition, Mr. Kerrigan at the time testified that he would tell Mr. Vasquez things he wouldn't even share with his own sister. Now, Mike Kerrigan is a joker sometimes, and it, but the idea was he was closer to Mr. Vasquez than a lot of, I am, to an awful lot of these people listed up there. And so the idea was that the, the Commission on Ethics found that Mr. Kerrigan, under the statute at that time, had a relationship with Mr. Vasquez, 19-year friendship, that was substantially similar to two of these categories and therefore at the time was required to abstain. Now he would be required to disclose and undertake the abstention analysis. And you notice I didn't say and abstain. He would be required to undertake the abstention analysis and tell the public why the, his relationship with Mr. Vasquez was um, one or was not one that would be that would materially affect the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in his circumstance. And again, the outcome is less important than the process to me, to the commission. So it is currently under consideration by the Nevada Supreme Court because the United States Supreme Court said, number one, other similar relationships does not make the statute unconstitutionally overbroad. And two, there was a defense that said, by censoring or requiring abstention, the Commission on Ethics infringed on uh, an elected official's constitutional right to free speech and that voting was a protected speech right. That's what was rejected by the United States Supreme Court. That court then said, okay, speech defense, not a shield against the abstention requirement that was in place in 2006. Go back to the Nevada Supreme Court and they can analyze whether any of the other arguments made to the Nevada Supreme Court caused the finding of a violation by Councilman Kerrigan to be valid or invalid, as the case may be. There were other arguments on vagueness and association and other grounds that we think do not carry the day, but the Supreme Court, Nevada Supreme Court, has an opportunity to revisit them and issue a new determination. So that's why I say it's currently under consideration by the Nevada Supreme Court for the second time. And if other similar relationships is deemed to have some uh, unlawful effect, it'll be removed or it will be un unenforceable until it's removed. We will tell you about that and you'll read more about it, trust me. But currently we're enforcing the provision E that says, and other similar relationships similar to the four enumerated categories. Here's our consanguinity chart, the big, bold, black box on the left side, you put your name in there or your spouse's name. 
and you look at all of the yellow boxes. That is the third degree of consanguinity or affinity. It's a pretty broad net. Note, you have a duty of inquiry. They don't have a duty of disclosure. So when I asked my 93-year-old aunt from the old country, hey, Aunt Ruth, what, do you, what kind of holdings do you have? <laughs> What's in the will? Am I going to get any? She basically told me to go pound sand. And I'm sure she counted that she you know, crossed me out of her will as well. She had no duty to disclose anything to me. And I can't create a conflict of something I don't know, but at least I asked. And how do you prove that you asked? There's a wonderful tool called email. First of all, I knew Aunt Ruth wasn't going to answer her email, but I asked. And secondly, I can prove that I asked. And then I have a record of what kinds of things I need to disclose or what kind of conflicts I have. Certainly, my spouse, my children, my parents, people that I am close to, I'm going to know more about the things that trigger conflicts than my you know, great-grandchildren or great-grandparents. But they are within the net. And know that if you're aware of any conflict created by your commitment in a private capacity to them, that's a disclosable interest. It needs to be disclosed. But not your second cousin, which is what um, Justice Alito of the United States Supreme Court said was an absurd result. He doesn't even know his second cousins, much less what their interests might be. All right, so Bruce Woodbury already intimated, helped us to define what you need to disclose. Disclose sufficient information to inform the public of the potential effect on you or your private commitments of this, um, of this conflict of interest. Apply that reasonable person standard that's put together in the statute and abstain in clear cases when the private commitment would likely have a material effect on a reasonable person's independence of judgment. Abstention should not be a safe harbor. Don't avo avoid the hard political questions because it's easier to just not vote. That had been used for many, many years by many, many elected officials. No longer is that a good reason to abstain because you have to undertake the analysis of why you're abstaining. So do your job. I know you will. If you want direction, especially if you don't have a lot of time. You can stay up late at night and use as a sleeping aid our ethics website. You can search by keyword. So that um, Richard Kirkland, I think, was the um, chief of police that used his, wore his uniform and his campaign stuff. Sure enough, you want to type in campaign uniform uh, uh, brochure. And guess what? Kirkland opinion is going to come up that sure enough, we said, look, he's in his uniform 24-7. That's his identity. It's not using his uh, government resources for his personal interests. That's who he is. So he can wear his uniform in his reelection brochure. Um, but you know, somebody can't don a judge's robe to pretend that they're a judge when they're running for judge because that's pretending. Anyway, that's it canon on judicial ethics things. The fact is, you can go onto our website, search with natural language, and see what you come up with. You can noodle around by year, by statute section, or by keyword, and learn more about it. See how the commission has applied the law in other cases, because that's the best way to understand the law. But, caveat, the law changes. So make sure that if you're reading an opinion that starts with 9-6, that's the year the request for opinion was brought to the Commission on Ethics. And in 2009, we changed our abstention standard. You might be reading old law. So when you're reading older opinions, make sure that law is still good law and take that into effect or consideration when you're, cons when you're looking at it. We don't have our digests of our opinions done. Actually, the last year that they were completed was 2002. So that annotations to the statutes, often you can go to a statute and there's like little paragraphs after that explain how it's been applied. Don't look there for us. We're still working on it. Andrew knows how understaffed we are. But we're getting there. So what happens if you violate the ethics and, the ethics and government laws? We impose a civil penalty only if your violation is deemed to be willful. Mr. Kerrigan was deemed to not have willfully violated the statute by voting. Because he got advice from his lawyers, they didn't have to, and that his disclosure by saying, 
I have no pecuniary interest in the matter, so I'm going to vote, was a sufficient disclosure for him to make and allowed him to vote. He relied on counsel. Now, there is a safe harbor provision. If you had insufficient time to seek legal advice, you asked for, or seek commission opinion, you asked for legal advice and certain other things, certain other circumstances, you can be absolved of a willful violation um, under very, very narrow circumstances. Your, your colleague, Brad Jerbic, has used this artfully uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, but um, all we can do is impose a civil penalty. Civil penalties are maxed out at a certain amount, and they start at zero. Um, and only if it's willful. Now, a willful violation is where you acted intentionally and knowingly, or you failed to act when you had a duty to act. And only if it's willful will there be a, a sanction. The penalties we're authorized to impose are up to $5,000 for a first willful violation, up to $10,000 for a separate second willful violation, and up to $25,000 for any subsequent. The most that has been imposed, to my recollection, is $5,000 uh, for each of three, and that was Kathy Augustine. Um, others have been $5,000 for a single willful violation, but. Kathy, um, Kathy Augustine received a $5,000 for each of three willful violations because she stipulated the facts and we didn't have to go through the whole hearing and investigatory procedure. With three willful violations, the commission is required to remove the public or to, to refer the public officer for remo removal from office. An elected official such as yourselves, that would be the district court of the jurisdiction, the second judicial district court for malfeasance or misfeasance in office. office. Um, for Controller Augustine, for a constitutional officer, it was the state senate. Um, we are able to refer you for removal from office if your badness factor is bad enough um, for the very first willful violation, but we're required to do so after three in your career, not in your current office. So here are some ideas in case you just want to be a troublemaker, Mr. Ayazi, and uh, create some ethical conflicts. Engage in self-dealing. How about accepting unnecessary gifts or benefits that would tend to improperly influence you? Peddle your influence. Use public property for your private advantage. Go ahead and use that confidential information to make a buck. Engage in uh, using your public office to find outside employment and uh, ignore the revolving door provisions of the law. Those are some really good ideas if you'd like to get into trouble. But here's how to make decisions when you can't get the Ethics Commission's advisory opinion in time. And this is not in the statute. This is purely fluff, dicta, Jewish mother advice. Clarify the situation. Take a deep breath. Often when members of the public approach you and allege certain acts on your behalf, you take it very personally because you work really hard and you have a reason to be defensive. But take a deep breath and clarify the situation. And then evaluate the facts. What did you do? Not what did it seem like you did. What was the appearance of impropriety? What did you do that caused this person to believe that there was an ethical violation that went on. And then please, talk to somebody else. That's what those people are employed to do in the city attorney's office. That's what your colleagues on the, on the dais are, are helpful for. Talk to somebody who understands the circumstance that you're in and understands the ethics and government laws who can be objective. Because you can't see it because you're so upset and you take your jobs very seriously, and you work very hard. And then, I'll give you the advice I give my children. Choose your best, best ethical option. I quote uh, Paul Douglas, not Dr. Phil, but Dr. Phil's got it when he says, you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences. Very much like if you ask us for an advisory opinion, and we tell you don't do that, and you go ahead and do it anyway, we're going to know about it. We're going to know about it. And it's sort of like Quinn, my five-year-old, he says, Mommy, can I have a cookie before dinner? And I say, oh, no, no cookies before dinner. But I can hear the top of the cookie jar. He's going to time out. And so will you. 
if you fail to heed the advice that you've asked the Ethics Commission to give to you. You choose the behavior, you choose the consequences. And finally, make a decision and implement it. Be confident that you've done everything in your power to do the right thing because 99 and 44 one hundredths of the public officers in the state of Nevada are good people trying to do the right thing. And we believe that. So make a good decision, do it, and if necessary, you can always modify and mitigate the harm. You may still be found to have violated the ethics and government laws, but know that the sanction will be mitigated as well if you in good faith do everything in your power to minimize the harm. We all make mistakes. And remember that learning to ride a unicycle is not intuitive. And neither is balancing your personal interests against the public trust. It's something that takes great rehearsal and great help. So please, reach out. Ask for an advisory opinion. Use the resources available to you. Reach out, and I, I promise you that if you reach out to the Nevada Commission on Ethics, we will be more than happy to give you the finger. The end. Well, Ms. Jenkins, thank you very much, first of all, for taking the time to come and, and make this presentation to us. And secondly, for taking a subject that could be very mm, boring and putting some personality. I mean, it's a lot of information there. It puts some personality and entertainment value in it. We thank you for that. So, Thank uh, you very much for having me. I've also provided to staff to provide to the council um, the ethics manual, which I've written in a, in a um, paragraph form, which is not as dry as reading the statutes. It's kind of a resource to, kind of, to guide you and to help you to develop some conversations among yourselves and, and maybe to look back. I hope that the, uh, the slide presentation that was provided today will also be a resource. Every um, piece of statute was uh, notated so that you can go to the statute itself and look at it. Please also know that on the very last slide of my presentation in big red letters is my direct dial line, which goes to my cell phone. And I'll, I'll remind you that there are rarely ethics emergencies and that you're welcome to call me after 5 a.m and before 8 p.m. because I fall asleep with my children. But that goes to me, and even if I'm not in the office, you're gonna get me, whether I'm traveling. Uh, the only time I don't answer it is when I'm making presentations such as this. So um, anytime you wanna come and talk about uh, issues, please do. And also know that I, I can't give you legal advice, but I could probably point you toward the statutes you need to look at and some of the cases to look up on our website. So once again, thank you very much for having me. I hope that the city will utilize this presentation again and again with the various boards and commissions that the, uh, the council appoints. And uh, if at any time you wish for me to come back and clarify anything, just please ask. Thank you. Any further questions?